the revolutionary dreams we need struggles wash away the painful memories of chili chili so we go vanquish a foe stop the songs of sirens chattering machine guns wounds found in your head bring back a brother from the dead tears cannot materialize of revolutionary dreams we need struggles Play the best of James Brown. Friend, smile, not frown. He said, Why are you frowning? I said, Because I can't do that. The best of James Brown.
Hello, hello, hello. Bienvenidos, bienvenidos. My name is Rad. I use they, them pronouns. I am wearing a white tank top. I'm a genderqueer brown person with short curly hair. There is a blue sky and a brown wooden fence behind me. I'm a cultural worker building consciousness between healing justice, system change, re-indigenization and queer futures. I'm your host for Study Into Action. Welcome to the fourth, fifth public session in our series. If you're using closed captions, you can click the pop out widget button on the bottom left of art.coop below the live stream window. If you click that, you can go to a web page to view closed captions and adjust the size of the text. Thank you for choosing to be here. Thank you for all that you do and all that you are. Thank you for choosing to build relationships across culture and solidarity economies, for choosing to study, to act, to transform, to dream, to seed the next world together. We encourage everyone tuning in to please watch session one, where there's a full land and labor acknowledgement to ground our series. We acknowledge that we primarily live and work on occupied Lenape Ho King, the, tra the traditional land of the Lenape people who have been displaced to various places around Turtle Island. Lenape was a center of trade for many of the first contact native nations in the Northeast. We pay respect to our Shinnecock, Wampanoag, Haudenosaunee, Nipmuc, Abenaki neighbors. We pay respect to their elders past and present for their continued stewardship of the land and commit to fighting against harmful policies and actions that degrade these lands and waters. Please take a moment to consider the many legacies of violence, displacement, migration and settlement that bring us together here today. Colonization through corporate greed and federal policies that push agendas to extract wealth from the earth, degrading sacred land and blatant disregard of treaty rights. Colonization is an ongoing process and decolonization is a present tense verb. Acknowledgement only becomes meaningful when coupled with authentic relationships, sustained commitment and informed action. Beginning the long, long work towards repair and healing will lead to fulfilling our responsibilities and obligations as guests on these lands by following the proper indigenous protocols and unsettling our colonized behaviors. Today, we will hear about solidarity grant making and investing case studies and solidarity grant making and investing to support grant makers in deepening their commitment to systems change, cultural restoration, and the land back movement. Land back means much more than settlers returning land that was stolen. It means that Native folks have full autonomy in taking care of the land, in deciding what happens with the land. We do this by supporting and repairing harm and destruction, transferring power and wealth back to native nations, advocating for indigenous rights by preserving language, customs and traditions, ensuring food sovereignty, housing, clean air and water. Support your local land and water protectors. As Francisco reminded us in session two, this solidarity economy is really an attempt to rebuild indigenous economies for the 21st centuries. As J.D. Thunderbird reminds us, do your aspirations move you closer to the land or to your colonizers? We can implicate ourselves by weaponizing our privileges to directly attack colonial ideals, institutions, infrastructure, and power. Let's get a sense of who's watching live. Please share your name. Please share your name, pronouns, the land you're on, and a few words about the energy you're bringing to this experience today. While this flows in, we want to thank Haystack Mountain School of Craft, who instigated Phase 1, and Open Collective Foundation, the home of the school for Phase 1 and 2. Study Into Action is produced with support from grant makers in the arts and the William and Flora, Flora Hewlett Foundation, as well as funds from sending partners, Minneapolis College of Art and Design, the Joan Mitchell Foundation, Arizona State University, The Field, 
Drexel University and the Guild of Future Architects. HowlRound Theater Commons is producing and distributing phase one and supporting us with ASL and closed captioning. Thank you, HowlRound. We are incubating a cooperative model of study. We aim to become socially and financially self-determined and invite you to support us in this effort with gifts of time, money, art, or open source code. Any surplus from phase one will support phase two and three of our work. Our budget's completely transparent and you can find it at opencollective.com slash study dash into dash action. Make sure to also follow us along on Instagram and Twitter at underscore art co-op. And if you're creating or doodling, taking notes, feeling inspired about what you hear in these sessions, we'd love to see and share your creations. So please share and tag us again at underscore art co-op. Beautiful. Thank you so much for sharing. What a group. We're here to build relationships, to connect cultural innovators across silos, popular educators, cultural organizers and creators, arts academics, economists, policymakers, technologists, grant makers who are building the cultural economy we want. Again, if you're just joining us, if you, want to, if you need closed captions, you can click the pop out widget button to go to a different web page to view the captions. And now I'll pass the mic on to Caroline Woolard. Hey everyone, welcome. My name is Caroline. I'm a co-organizer of Art.coop Study Into Action with Nati and Marina. I'm a white woman with a black print shirt and short hair coming to you from Berlin, Germany through Zoom. Zoom is headquartered on the unceded ancestral territories of the Moekma. And here we are studying into action. And study is often slow, like art making, like labor, like healing and caretaking. But cooperative scholar, Dr. Jessica Gordon Emhard reminds us that quote, almost every contemporary cooperative that I have studied began as the result of a study group. Study leads to action. Today is just a small part of an intergenerational effort to socialize and dream and move from study into action together. In fact, the land back work that we're gonna learn about today began when Rhonda and Carlos, two of the presenters, met at a talk. So here we are. We're inviting you to get active in the chat, to sign up for more together, to visit art.coop to view the past recordings, and to read the report that Nathi and I got to write and synthesize from interviews with 100 people, many of you who are here active in the chat right now, making culture in the solidarity economy. We're here because you asked us to hold this space, and we know it's just a small moment holding a lot that we all are building together. Thank you for choosing to be present, and Marina will, will put a link to that report if you want to read it. Welcome. I'm now going to pass the mic back to Rad. Now we move on. I'd love to introduce our presenters for the day. I'll begin with Dana Kawaoka Chen, Partners and Guides Philanthropy in Reimagining Practices that Advance a Thriving and Just World. Dana leads with vision and is guided by relationships. As a practitioner, Dana co-authored The Choir Book, a framework for social justice philanthropy, and was a primary contributor to Resonance, a framework for philanthropic transformation. Welcome, Dana. Next, we have Rhonda Anderson. Rhonda is in Inupiaq, Atabascan from Alaska, her native enrollment village is Katowic. Her life work, most importantly, is as a mother, as well as a classically trained herbalist, silversmith, and activist. Yes, a silversmith. She works as an educator within area schools and the five colleges near her home in Massachusetts. Her activism ranges from removal of mascots, water protector, indigenous identity, and protecting her traditional homelands in the Arctic National Wildlife Refu Refuge from extractive industry. Welcome, Rhonda. Next, we have Stacy Klein. 
Stacy is a radical visionary who came to the realization that she could not find a place among institutionalized formalities or rigid identities to create her art. In 1982, Stacy became the founding artistic director of Double Edge in Boston, Massachusetts. Welcome, Stacy. And lastly, we have Carlos Uriona. Carlos is lead actor, creator, and puppeteer and grassroots organizer originally from Argentina. In 2002, Carlos and artistic director Stacy Klein conceived Double Edge's annual summer series of indoor-outdoor traveling spectacle performances. Closely connected to this work is Carlos's role as the leader of Double Edge's grassroots campaigns and audience development initiatives. Welcome, Carlos. We'd love to now turn it over to our presenters. Thank you so much, Rad, for that warm welcome. And thanks to all of you for inviting me via Zoom into your homes. I am participating in today's webinar from unceded Ohlone territory, otherwise known as San Jose, California. Uh, as a visual description, I am a Japanese American woman with freckles. I'm wearing blue frame glasses and I have just below shoulder length uh, black hair. I am also wearing a blue shirt that has a geometric uh, print uh, with a white pattern. Um, to ground our conversation about the cultural economy we want, um, I think it's important to understand some of the predominant systems at play. So I'm gonna now uh, share a quick presentation as a frame for uh, our conversation today. Like other forms of wealth in the US, philanthropic wealth can be directly traced back to industries of extraction and exploitation, including slavery, stolen land from indigenous people, and the systemic undervaluing of women's work. However, it was the Revenue Act of 1913 that we found to have codified several things. Public charities and independent foundations had been in existence for decades and had operated for the public good. This act formally started the era in which tax policy regulated philanthropic activities and incentivized charitable giving. These laws created a distinct nonprofit sector defined by their legal status. This was the beginning of the nonprofit industrial complex in which the government had the ability to monitor and therefore control social movements, as well as a reliance on state foundation and corporate funding that has now derailed the course of many social movements. Hence, nonprofits and can only be as radical as their donors and often must shape their activities to align with donor interests. With tax policy providing the framework for institutional philanthropy, let's take a quick look at the culture that has emerged as a result. The dominant worldview perpetuated by philanthropy is oligarchy in which power rests with a small number of people. The predominant thought leadership reinforces colonialism or a practice or policy of control by one people or power over others, often establishing um, economic dominance. The purpose of institutional philanthropy then becomes to protect the wealth and interest and reputation of those with wealth. And then the purpose translates into grant-making processes which foster competition, the impact of which serves to reinforce the status quo. Just to note, these reflections, um, as indicated in the um, picture on this slide, uh, were responses actually from um, people who work in institutional philanthropy. This overall paradigm of philanthropy reflects how institutional philanthropy is both a product of and perpetuator of the extractive economy. This is the just transition framework as it has been articulated by the Climate Justice Alliance and Movement Generation. On the left is a representation of our current characterized as being organized around the right to accumulate wealth through the exploitation of labor, extraction of our natural resources and enforced through militarism. 
the just transition is for us to begin to hospice this economy while building the one on the right, which privileges people and planet thriving by being in deep relationships with each other and our planet through being engaged in regenerative practices that allow for the wealth of the productive labor of each community to remain in that community and governed by deep democracy. As our colleague Aaron Tanaka of the Center for Economic Democracy says, the reparations principle begins with directing us to fund in communities most harmed through historic extraction and explicitly fund black and indigenous organizations driving actual reparations campaigns. But this alone is insufficient. We also invest in communities to reorient their relationship to capital, control their own assets and break dependence from the dominant extractive economy. So how do we move into a regenerative economy to build the cultural economy we need? The words of Walida Imarisha give us guidance to cultural workers. Quote, we can't build what we can't imagine, end quote. It's important for all of us in building the cultural economy we need to think about what is possible. Once our team at Justice Funders was introduced to the Just Transition Framework, one of the roles we've played in philanthropy is to reimagine how wealth is governed. We believe that philanthropy must support the agency of communities to implement solutions and imagine new models for governing philanthropic resources, human, financial, and knowledge that redistribute wealth, democratize power, and shift economic control to communities. This has manifested in a framework that we call Resonance, a framework for philanthropic transformation. And I believe Marina will be dropping a link in the chat. Building on this work, Nati and Caroline completed a beautiful companion piece to Resonance um, in which they detail how traditional philanthropy can adopt more solidarity economy practices and offer examples of what this could look like. I wanna lift up two examples of movement building organizations and two examples of philanthropic responses to solidarity grant making and investments for us to study this morning. The Right to the City Alliance is a national movement building organization that is working for the right to land and housing that's free from market speculation and serves the interests of community building, sustainable economies and cultural and political space. When we look at models for the solidarity economy, Right to the City models a resource sharing model between their national alliance and its 90 member organizations, where members form a resource sharing committee and collectively decide how to allocate resources across their network. The Katali Foundation has an environmental justice portfolio in which the strategy and grants have been determined by nine women of color activists not the foundation's board. And they were able to move 5 million in 2020 and almost 32 million in 2021. In addition, the Restorative Economies Fund seeks to close the racial wealth gap and transform our financial system by strategically reinvesting resources into community owned and governed projects, often with an integrated capital approach. So not just the grants, but also investments that are really about um, creating shared prosperity, self-determination, building collective political, economic, and cultural power. The Boston Ujima Project is facilitating the first democratically governed investment fund in the US. Anyone can invest and through citywide assemblies facilitate democratic governance of the fund. This models non-extractive investments made to cooperatives and businesses that are facilitating the solidarity economy. The Swift Foundation has reimagined their endowment management. For some years now, their investment portfolio has been 99% fossil free. The board also split their endowment into two portfolios where 50 million is in a market rate portfolio to maintain their staff and grant making. However, this does not grow. There's also a 10 million transitional investment portfolio that funds new economy opportunities primarily in indigenous communities. As we think about these case studies and the examples we will shortly hear more about, I wanna invite us to do an exercise. If you would please get out a scratch piece of paper 
and a pen. I'd like you to try writing with your non-dominant writing hand. And in cursive, please write this sentence. Regenerative systems will require us to build new muscles. Notice what this exercise feels like. Is it hard? Do you have to go slower? Do you really have to concentrate? If I may submit to you, this exercise is analogous to the work that we need to do to build the solidarity economy. Obviously, it's easier and faster and more comfortable to do things that we already know how to do. In fact, as the status quo, we may even get rewarded for doing so. The challenge before us is to not only get competent in our ability to relearn how to do all the things that we already know how to do, but to do so with a different intention and in conditions where it will be the spaces that we create together that supports our practice. In closing, Please build new regenerative muscles through supporting land back campaigns across the country. When we consider the magnitude of natural man-made disasters happening, we need our philanthropies to go all in on helping to usher the world we want, the world we need. The narrative of our future has yet to be written, but it requires us to start now. If any of this content resonated, please join a Justice Funders webinar on activating grants and investments to fund solidarity economies on September the 30th. Marina will be putting more information on how to join in the chat. And now on to you, Rhonda. Hey everyone, thank you so much for your presentation, Dana. Um, I just, we just wanted to come on, uh, Art Doc Co-op wants to acknowledge that the sounds shared by Dreamy are one form of cultural appropriation by a non-native artist and uh, repair is necessary. This perpetuated the erasure of native culture and we're deeply, deeply sorry for not taking more care or responsibility in collaborating uh, towards this sound creation. We're committed to working together to repair this harm and understand that we might not get the opportunity to do so we understand if anyone needs to leave or has already left and we're more than willing to have this conversation to make space for this conversation again we're really really sorry and we're yeah we we, we acknowledge this this harm and so we understand that if folks can't continue with us today yeah thank you Um, thank you very much for your um, apology. Um, part of what our conversation here today is about relationship building, building trust and reciprocity. And um, in doing that relationship building, there's an understanding of, um, you know, the cultural appropriation, the stereotyping, um, the pan-Indianisms, um, understanding our how colonization still affects us today and understanding that our traditional ceremonies were illegal until 1978 and um, our ceremonies and medicines have been totally uh, appropriated through extraction um, and so they are for us and ours um, uh, some of the words, I think, more than anything, um, felt very um, harmful, more than um, a tribe called Red is amazing. So thank you for playing a tribe called Red and Sisters is my favorite track. So I appreciate that, hearing that, and I appreciate um, the moment. This moment is a learning moment, and I really appreciate that very much. So... Kaktovik mea goranga, Fairbanks mea naya nuranga, Pangma pakano uranga, Koinami, Anupak Shinaga Alak, um, Ariga Rhonda Anderson, uh, Shavakutunga Western Massachusetts Commissioner on Indian Affairs to me, and uh, co director and founder of Okoteo Cultural Center, 
and um, executive director of, and founder of uh, Native Youth Empowerment Foundation. So thank you very much for listening. Um, my name is Rhonda Anderson. I am a Anupak Athabaskan from Alaska. Um, I just greeted you traditionally like in my Anupiat language. Um, I have lived here in Western Massachusetts, Coleraine for um, most of my life, not Coleraine, but most of my life I've been in Western Massachusetts. And I am very connected to my community in Alaska as well. I go back home very often. Um, kind of grew up between states, you know, Massachusetts and Alaska. Um, the land that I'm privileged to steward and live on in Coleraine is um, the Sokoki Abenaki and Pakamtuk traditional homelands on the Pakamagon watershed, which is known as the Green River today. Um, I think we were going to be talking about the story, the creation story of Okiteo. And I had the very fortunate moment to be present in this, this moment of being in, in support of my dear friend, uh, Larry Spotted Crow Man. Uh, he was having a talk at UMass about being a water protector. This was in early 2017 when there was still a movement at Ochete Shakoin camp. Um, at the Standing Rock community for the No uh, Dakota Access Pipeline. Uh, and I happened to be sitting right next to Carlos uh, of Double Edge Theater. And we got to talking and he was saying how um, Double Edge was planning a yearly town-wide spectacle and was looking for essentially an indigenous voice, historical information, something to talk about indigenous people of the area. And what he found was, um, well, and Stacy, what Double Edge had found was an entire communities were rendered invisible. Um, so I decided to, to visit Double Edge facilities. I met Stacy, who's amazing. And I started to get, um, started to draw different contexts, um, different individuals, tribal leaders, community members, communities that call Ashfield, where Double Edge is located, their traditional home. And we started having this conversation, you know, well, we're still here, there's 50,000 Native people living in Massachusetts. Um, and so Stacy said, hey, you know, I am renovating this barn. And perhaps we can, you know, work together. Maybe we can have a library or a place where people can go and find out more information. And I thought, you know what we, we really need? We really need a place that is not institutional. We are in the five college area. There's lots of students that are here and there's lots of NAIS programs but it doesn't feel very accessible to the larger community. And there's also no safe space where native people can just be native people, um, where we can have our own gatherings, our own ceremonies and tell our own stories and not have this institution kind of like looming over our shoulders. Um, and plus I had grown up in the town next to a double edge, Plainfield. And I always felt kind of alone. And I wondered why at a young Rhonda, a very young age, I wondered why this area wasn't frequented or you know, inhabited by more native families, native tribes of the area. And it wasn't until I grew up that I learned about the policies of dispossession, um, particularly the ones that were in the 1950s through the 1970s where families were given $2,000 to move to urbanized areas and then the land was usurped. Um, I had this very real feeling growing up out there, it's very rural, um, that being out on the land and reconnecting to the land in a way that is important to our culture is reconnecting to your own self. You have a better idea of who you are when you're out there and you're connecting to the world. You're in that natural place. You're not, you know, up against all the city noise and traffic and screens. You're really with a circadian rhythm. Um, 
you're taken in by this more natural environment. And indigenous people, we have been dispossessed of our traditional lands. Um, not having this access to the land means not having access to traditional medicines, not having access to safe spaces for ceremonies or safe spaces for gatherings, especially here in Massachusetts, um, particularly because most of the indigenous communities have been forcibly removed from their land. They've had their, been dispossessed from their land and no longer have access to land. And land is just an incredible part of who you are. Um, particularly in Massachusetts, I've noticed um, a lot of the tribal um, names like Nipmuc, people of the fresh water, Pakumtuk, people of a clear fishing stream, Nanatuk, the people where the oxbow part of the river is. Um, their name is, uh, identifies them, their communities identify with the land that they're on. So I felt like, you know, that, and, 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 and most indigenous communities also identify um, either as the real human, uh, Inupiaq, um, or um, the land that you're on. So Stacy, Stacy said, come on, we, we have this space, come and take a look at it. And it was an incredibly, you know, like barn, it was kind of falling in, but we, I had already seen the barns and the work that they're doing at Double Edge. And I could see into the future, I could see this amazing space. And so I began introductions to different people that you know could help run this space. And it ended up just being Larry and myself for right now. And I think we make like a really good team together. Our ideas are on the same page. We both have the same visions for the future and you know, our communities, our native youth, and we are so willing to give our time freely to see that this happens. Um, and what I, I appreciate so much is that Stacy really had opened up that door for allowing access to the indigenous community, for giving that space that we so desperately needed. We're the only native owned and operated, uh, cultural center in central and Western Massachusetts. Um, there's very little representation of who we are and, and it shows particularly, you know, in, in this area. Um, I feel that that is the biggest part of our success is creating that trust, that reciprocity, that relationship with Double Edge and Stacy. Um, she's seeing how difficult it is for Indigenous communities to have access to land. And, you know, she understands that dispossession. She understands that there's a privilege to have land. Um, also, Stacy is also understanding as we're working through um, becoming an organization, is she's seeing that you know there is not necessarily an access. Um, indigenous people, we've been blocked from access to funding, um, philanthropy organizations. We um, we we we've had we have a lot of different hurdles that we're overcoming. Um, some of them are education. I mean, some of them is just being indigenous. Like I'm Anupak Athabaskan, and I always like to share this story of my own village. My enrollment village is Koktovik. Um, that's up on the Beaufort Sea in Area 1002 of the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge in Alaska. Um, and our communities in Alaska weren't displaced, but our land was sold to the United States. And the United States through ANSCA, Alaska Native Land Claim Settlement Act, returned it to us um, with you know, several hundreds of million acres and um, plus hundreds of millions of dollars. And that money was supposed to be invested in creating 13 organizations, um, with the 13th organization being outside of Alaska and the other 12 would be regions within Alaska. And what happened was, was the government said, here's money, here's, um, you know, you need to start up regional corporations to oversee the extractive industries that are on your lands. And so now um, you are business people. Before that, we were subsistence people, hunter gatherers. We cared for our communities. Um, now we're business people and we're in the extractive industry and it's, it's mind boggling. It's almost like we're set up to fail. Um, most of the organizations that were set up have failed. 
Um, Arctic Slope Regional Corporation and Koktobuk Anupia Corporation are the two that I'm enrolled in. They're some of the strongest, and that's because they are heavily tied into the extractive industry. Um, a lot of the values that are given that, that uh, indigenous communities uh, revolve around um, were, were community oriented, were subsistence oriented, or of a totally different mindset, were about taking care of the land, not extracting from the land. So I hope it, I mean, it might not explain a whole lot, but it kind of does. It's, it's very difficult in some aspects um, to be doing the work that we're doing and, and we're, we have so many barriers that we have to overcome. And I believe that Stacy and Double Edge has really, um, really come to terms with uh, taking this model and giving us the space and the resources and using that privilege uh, to help, um, you know, a, a community that really needs help. We're marginalized, we're still oppressed, we're still facing colonization. And, you know, I, I am eternally grateful for the space and we've created land use. Um, here I am, I'm talking to you folks today. Um, we've started a model and um, we're really hoping that this that this takes off. It, it can, can happen. I'd like to turn it over to Stacy now to, to sort of tie everything in. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Rhonda. I'm also sorry for what happened. And I want to say that um, I think this is one of the reasons that we continue to try to make decolonization an everyday practice. It And through our work partnering with Okiteo, um, we're trying to do that. We have learned Okiteo was first um, just supposed to be for itself and indigenous people to have a space finally for their ceremony, their sacred, their daily, their social practices, their youth, their paddles, regalia, wampum, drumming. Drumming has been heard for the first time in 200 years in the land of the Nipmuc where Double Edge and Okiteo reside. Um, it became clear that we also needed to partner on educational um, aspects of this because the community didn't know what was going on. They were taught that there were never native communities in the land. Um, and the, the survival of Okiteo and indeed the indigenous people of the area necessitated education. Um, there's so much colonialist narrative around that that is overwhelming um, the need for them to face and change and teach always takes over and becomes the dominant narrative so that they can barely have time for their own practices. Um, the other thing that's challenging that we are trying to support is that they have been left out of a system of grant making, of marketing, of space, of basically everything, administration. And so Double Edge has tried to support all of that and provide an infrastructure for Rhonda and Larry to do the incredible work that they're doing. Um, and I, I wanna emphasize that we could all, um, we can all share land, we can all um, give space, um, all these things that are desperately needed, but we need to accompany that with action and with um, overcoming these systemic problems and helping to build and rebuild communities. Um, I think indigeneity, I have learned, is a way of seeing. It's a living way. It is non-transactional. 
Thank you. All right. Thank you, Dana, Rhonda, Carlos, and Stacy. Um, to clarify for anyone who's not sure what happened, um, the sounds played at the start of this event were harmful and the contextualization was disrespectful. Uh, cultural appropriation shows that you don't have to like a person or respect their identity to feel entitled to take from them. This might not be the intention, but it is the impact. Uh, we're committed to repair and healing and transformative justice to work through what happened today with the sounds and to continue our work as allies to educate ourselves, each other, and our communities around the culture that makes this possible. We continue our series next Friday, October 1st, with our last session at the same time. 12 p.m. Eastern with making slash meaning, a live jam session slash zine making workshop with Sierra Peters and Paige of the Boston Ujima Project to brainstorm and create music, media, and printed materials together. Also, thank you to everyone who reached out this past week about joining a cohort. For this first iteration of Study Into Action, we brought together folks from the art.coop report that we interviewed or who added themselves to the directory. Uh, to join our cohorts after our live talks. In the future, we will let you know how you can get involved in the cohorts. Thank you so much. Uh, have a great weekend and see you next week. <laughs>